please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2 and find verses 1 to 4 where we'll focus our attention this morning. A Scottish barge named Priscilla changed the officer of watch at approximately 2 a.m. on July 18th last year. The groggy officer of watch took the captain's wheel and heard the status report and took command. As the night was calm and the course was well known, one they'd traveled many times around the North Horn of Scotland, heading out to the open Atlantic, the officer of watch dismissed the rest of the crewmen on the bridge. He said he'd take it from there. What a nice guy. At around 4 a.m., the officer of watch was alerted to danger by the startling alarms of sophisticated navigational equipment. Alarms that he then shut off because he knew where he was and he knew where he was going and he didn't want to be bothered. He not only shut them off, he pulled the fuses and disconnected the battery backups. There was no way they would accidentally help him. At 4.39 a.m. with the bridge navigation watch alarm system disabled, failing to heed multiple radio hails from land of people who saw the Priscilla too close, the Priscilla ran aground just north of Orkney, Scotland. The officer of watch was shocked, surprised, and immediately sprang into action, turning back on the navigational and warning systems and calling in the wreck. The shore that Priscilla ran upon was smooth and soft and just caused this behemoth of a ship to list a bit. Had it not been for a great deal of her cargo falling into the bay, the minor wreck might not even have made national news, let alone international news. But when 330,000 tons of natural fertilizer is dumped into the water, people nowadays aren't happy. It was a quite poopy situation for the locals. <laughs> but especially for the officer of the watch. When investigators drilled into how this accident occurred, they noticed that all the warnings were shut off during the time of the incident. The systems had been disabled. When interrogated, he admitted to binge-watching episodes of Britain's Got Talent and shutting off all the beeping so he could focus. Doesn't that sound absurd to not listen to the warnings? And not only to not listen to the warnings, but to shut them off. And not only to not listen to the warnings, but to shut them off and fill your mind with something so wholesome and helpful as Britain's Got Talent. I wonder for you, friend, when God warns you, do you listen? Or would you rather binge watch something else? This morning from God's word, we're going to be warned by God. Will you listen? Please stand with me and hear from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, the warning that drifting from Christ is deadly. Hebrews 2, the first four verses. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to prove to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape If we neglect such a great salvation, it was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning reminded of your grace to warn us of danger, your kindness to show us where we tend to drift. Help us to listen. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. From this warning, we can extrapolate two safeguards to employ in light of the warning of the deadliness of drift. 
The first is in the, half, the first half of chapter 2, verse 1. Listen carefully to Jesus. That's it. Listen carefully to Jesus. Notice in verse 1, therefore, or maybe your Bible says, or for this reason. The preacher says, scoop up the context, take all we've got to this point, and apply it. We must bring the context of chapter 1 to the warning of chapter 2. Otherwise, all it does is scare you. You don't need scared. You need to be safe. That's what warnings do. They give you the opportunity to be safe. This preacher saying, look, take all this stuff and be safe in Christ because of this. Remember the preacher in the context is contrasting Christ uh, with the angels to show that Jesus and his new and living way is how he describes it in chapter 10. This, This Jesus is better than anything else the angels. Why were they important? Because they mediated the first testament, the old covenant. We'll we'll get to that, but, but who was Jesus? Well, he didn't mediate something. He was the message. He was the final message. The angels, they, they served those who are saved. Chapter one, verse 14, Jesus purified us into salvation. Chapter one, verse three, the angels, they worship Christ. Jesus sits on the throne and receives worship. Jesus is better, chapter 1 declares unequivocally and celebrates uniquely. Chapter 2 is no different. The preacher just adds the application of directing our lives at Jesus no matter what. When we see therefore, our ears should perk up because why does it matter that Jesus is better? Why do you need the doctrine found in chapter 1? Jesus is the Son of God, so what? Therefore, you apply it like this. The preacher reminds us that truth unapplied is really truth not understood. To understand truth about Jesus is to apply truth about Jesus. You don't understand truth about Jesus if it doesn't change your life for Jesus. Don't forget While Hebrews is a sermon dripping uh, with the beautiful Christology and oozing this healthy theology, it's an exhortation. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 22, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. What's the preacher mean? He says, I'm going to give you some hard stuff that you need to put into practice. You need to work on it. You need to persevere in it. He's expecting us to have difficulty with some of these things. Some of these applications will be hard. To be confronted by the truths in his sermon, we need to persevere in applying his sermon. He's exhorting us. You've heard Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Preacher's our friend today. He will wound us. Therefore, because of who Christ is, the preacher will not let us drift into the destruction of judgment. This is a life or death drift. You stick to Christ or you die. This preacher's warning is congregation that he loves and he exhorts them and he implores them because of the supremacy of Christ in chapter one, because Jesus truly is over all, then we must listen carefully to him, verse one. Notice the preacher says we. We are a body. If you ever feel like I'm preaching at you, either I'm in sin or you're not listening. We need this together. We. The preacher to the Hebrews is an exemplary model of using the two main methods of preaching. The first one is the finger in your face. You've got to do this. Your life depends on this. The second one is we have to do this. We're together in this. He does them both throughout the letter. Here he's wrapping his arms around us. Come on, people, let's go towards Christ. The preacher says we. He's communicating his love. We are together in this. Our pursuit of safety in Christ is how we avoid the difficulty of drift. There's no other way. You pursue Christ or you drift away. Pastors, shepherds, internet preachers who fail to realize that every warning first comes through their heart, then out their mouth, are missing the point. This preacher says, we. Who escapes we? Only a fool. We all need warned. We. This is warm. It's kind. 
This preacher's for us. He's on our side. He's not against us. He's elbow deep in the muck of our struggle. But the truth is going to be hard. But remember, it comes from a gentle shepherd. What is the truth? The truth is that if we don't listen and keep on listening to our Savior, we will drift and keep on drifting from him. Because of who Christ is in chapter 1, we have to pay close attention to him in chapter 2. The idea we see here to, to we must pay close attention, it's, it's a technical idiom that is unique to the letter of to the Hebrews in this form. When the preacher says we must pay closer attention, it's kind of clunky in English. It loses some of its oomph because it's a nautical term. I'm beholding to William Lane, a Hebrew scholar, for this insight. But this idea to play, pay closer attention is to set the course of your ship on the port. You set the course of your life on Christ. And you hold your course for that port no matter what. When you do that, you pay careful attention to where you're headed. Your destination is clear. Everyone on the ship does their job so the captain can keep the ship pointed in the right direction. Did you know that every single shipping voyage that's ever happened has the same single end goal? To get back to land. The ocean scares me. I don't even like ponds. Oceans, they give me the willies. The flu's been running through our family this week, so I parent, as all dads do, turned on the TV, and uh, we were watching a documentary on ocean life, the kids and I. It was Arctic ocean life, and I sit there I'm watching this boat, a 15-foot research yacht that looked quite luxurious, but uh, no, 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 this massive yacht is hitting 15-foot waves. It just goes up, crests the wave, and what's all the water do? And the, the whole deck is covered, and I'm starting to sweat, and then I'm feeling cold and wet, and I realized I'd spilled my ice water, and it was like this <laughs> crazy experience. I do not like the open water. No, thank you. In the ancient world, if you wanted to go a great distance, you either traveled 20 to 40 miles a day, depending on your age and the terrain, by walking, or you hopped on a boat. You didn't ride animals. That was for the ultra-rich and the royalty or those who had money and were doing caravans and such. So many people in this day had traveled by boat especially if they were living in Rome as ex-Jews who'd made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. These people, if you'll notice as you read through Hebrews on your own, there's a good number of nautical-flavored things, and these people would have picked up what this preacher is doing. He says, remember when you were on the rough Mediterranean Sea? You didn't know where you were. You, you couldn't read the stars your captain was standing at the helm and he was holding the wheel and he was paying attention and he was keeping his focus on the direction that you needed to go to get you to the destination where you needed to be. He was paying close attention to get you off the boat onto the shore so you could go from where you were to where you wanted to be. Now, brother, now, sister, your life is the boat on the seas of this world. You will drift and you will die if you don't focus on your destination, if you don't set your course for the port where only Christ is. That's the idea our preacher is preaching. Avoid the perils of the sea. Set your focus and attention on the land where you desire to be. One Greek scholar translates it like this. We ought, therefore, to pay the greatest attention to what we've heard. And that's a better translation because this is not comparative. This is not pay just a little bit more attention to Jesus than something else. This is pay the most attention that you can to just Jesus. Because of who Christ is, the one who's greater than all, we should pay greater attention to him than anything else. You say, but what about, and the preacher to the Hebrews says, no. You say, but what about, uh, you know, I have all the struggles in my family. The preacher says, 
pay attention to Jesus. You say, but my mortgage is too much. The preacher says, pay attention to Jesus. You say, uh, but, but our kids have these needs. The preacher says, pay attention to Jesus. You say, but my marriage has, the preacher says, pay attention to Jesus. You say, but I want to be married. The preacher says, pay attention to Jesus. He's marvelously clear. Your life depends on you listening to Christ. With your all of every effort, what is Jesus telling you? If you were on a stormy sea, in the boat, crashing down on the waves, spray coming over the deck, you want to look at the captain and you want to see him doing what? Focusing on where he's trying to get you. You don't want to see him watching YouTube golf tutorial videos. You don't want to see him reading a cookbook. You, you don't want to see him looking at pictures of the grandkids. What do you want from him? You want him to get you where you need to go. Friend, you're the captain of your ship. What are you paying attention to? What are you focused on? We need to pay attention to what we've heard. If we're going to listen carefully to Jesus, then we need to be clear on what we've heard. And then don't drift from that. Focus on your destination, the person and the salvation and the work of Jesus Christ, and go there. What have you heard? Chapter 1, Jesus is better. Jesus is the final revelation. Jesus is our only hope at purification. Jesus is our only way to salvation. And you're preoccupied with getting a raise. And you're going to build a company that's going to burn. And you're going to get a promotion that once you're dead don't matter. You hear preaching every week, I trust, that points you to who Christ is. Do you listen? This is why you need Grace Life. One more sermon. So you can pay attention, close attention. This is why you need Grace Life. This is why you need Grace Group. This is why you need your every woman's grace. This is why you need your men's study. This is why you need fellowship. This is why you need discipleship. So someone can say, hey, friend, did you notice that your life is drifting that way and Jesus is going this way? We should be pursuing these things. We should be in fellowship where life runs through the grid of what Christ desires. We should be in discipleship where people are talking directly into our life. We should be evangelizing other people so we're confronted with the reality that we're telling them Jesus is better than anything else and yet our life says, meh. We should be preaching Christ to ourselves so that we are focused on him. Do you see how this is active? You have to do this. The captain doesn't stand at the wheel wondering which way it'll turn. He holds it. He directs it because he knows where he's trying to go and he's been told how to get there. Too many Christians are on the sea of their feelings, letting it drive them this way and that like wind on the ocean. They feel good about Jesus one day and bad about him the next. And then they wonder why they're a mess and not following Jesus and instead drifting because they're not pursuing him. Set your focus, set your direction, chart the course of your life to Christ. Take hold of the wheel. Set your course for Christ and pay close attention to what you've heard of him. Everything you do in your life is to be pointed at Christ. Why? Because you read chapter one. What did it say? That Jesus is better than anything. Do you agree? Who cares if you agree? Does your life agree? Don't fail to understand this is not a mere hearing. Oh, interesting. This is setting your course by what you've heard. Imagine tax day, 1912. You know what happened then? Titanic sank. The captain of the Titanic, he heard the reports of extra ice on the water that night. The captain of the Titanic knew that the water was calm and made it harder to see the icebergs that night. The captain of the Titanic had heard from other ships that there was ice near their course. And what did the captain do with all that he'd heard? Didn't listen. He died. He heard all those things 
but he didn't listen and it cost him his life. I wonder, are you listening to Christ? Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But it's not a one and done. It's you have to keep listening, keep paying close attention like your life depends on it. Point the nose of your life directly at Christ and forget about all the other stuff. And you say, but, and the preacher of the Hebrews says, forget about it. How do you know if you're listening to Christ? Look at your life. You believe the beauty of Christ deserves the affection of your whole life. That's how you know if you're listening to Christ. When you understand Christ is the final word, you stop listening to all the noise. When you realize your salvation is all wrapped up in him, all you want is him because he's all that you need. You pursue an affection and a devotion and a concentration on Christ that's above every worldly distraction. You pursue a way of life that runs everything through the grid of the love of Christ for you. This is a constant pursuit of the believer's life. Psalm chapter 105, verse 4, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence on Sunday mornings. Seek his presence continually. This, this pursuit has a destination. Colossians chapter three, the first two verses. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. This is our active pursuit of Christ. We're actively pursuing Christ or are we? Because there's no middle ground. There's no promise for tomorrow. You have today, right now, to seek him, are you? If not, then instead of thinking you're a Christian who is struggling, you should be more honest with yourself. Psalm 10, verse 4, in the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. He said, well, I'm not wicked. Prove it. If you're not seeking him, what gives you assurance that you're righteous? There really is only two kinds of humanity, those who seek God and those who don't, those who are righteous and those who aren't. Psalm 10 verse 4 concludes, his thoughts, his thoughts are there is no God. Either we are longing to know Christ or we are fooling ourselves. That's the warning. Listen carefully to Jesus. Friends, if you listen carefully to Jesus, if you believe that by faith he is and he's the rewarder of those who seek him, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, then, then this, the consequences in this verse are not for you, praise God. But if that is not you, then this verse is for you. I can't help you. which is why we see second, we have to watch closely for drift. Look at the second half of verse one. Pay attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. What happens if we don't pay closest attention to Christ? You drift away. You say, but, I don't see any buts. You pay close attention to him or you drift away from him. If you don't listen to what you've heard, you drift away from what you've heard. The inevitable result of not pursuing Christ is losing Christ. You say, whoa, 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 preacher, you're coming in a little hot. I don't know about that. The preacher to the Hebrews says we must chart our course and pay close attention to sailing our ship towards Christ and if we don't, we will drift away. You say, well, I got eternal security. Well, that's a, I believe it. But do you have it? The preacher here is paralleling two nautical terms, charting your course and drifting off course. Charting your course for Christ or drifting away from Christ. Both sailing terms. Imagine you're on the sea by yourself. 
You have no sextant, no compass, no GPS, and if you had those, you wouldn't know what to do with them anyway. You're seeking a shore, but you don't know where it is. You're just floating on the sea. What will happen? You'll be lost. Oh, we think such a tragedy. But that's not what's being described here. Not at all. What's being described here is you have everything you need and you choose to unplug it and not listen to it. You have heard Christ. Are you chasing after him? Imagine you're the captain of the MSC Arena. It's the largest ship in the world, if you didn't know. 1,312 feet long, 200 feet wide. Cost $600 million to build in China. There have been a lot more here. She's launched at the end of last year. She has 20 different separate navigation systems at the captain's disposal. Not to mention meteorology equipment that rivals government agencies. She has her own Doppler radar system. She has the most advanced sonar system in the commercial world. She has radar for vessels, both friendly and foe. She has a gyro compass, a magnetic compass, the most advanced chart tracking system, an echo sounder, multiple satellite relay systems, light signaling systems, and more. And all of these systems, just like an airplane, are, airplane are, are redundant. So they have a backup. In case one goes down, they got something else. One estimate puts the navigation and meteorology equipment on this ship at $60 million. I don't know a lot about big boats, but that seems like a lot of money. This is the Lincoln Continental of cruise ships. You get in, you push the buttons, and you get there. But here's what's described in chapter 2 of Hebrews. You're the captain of the MSC arena. And one day you say, you know, self, it's a beautiful day. I'm tired of all this beeping and buzzing and dinging and ponging and clicking. I'm just going to shut all this stuff off. I'm going to pull the plug. So you do. You pull the plug. You take out the batteries so there's no battery backup. And you go from the bridge up to the top where the antennas and the Doppler are, and you lay your beach towel out there, and you soak up the sun, and you begin to drift. You've got $60 million worth of stuff that tells you where to go, but you unplugged it. $60 million to tell you, hey, warning, but you unplugged it, and you drift. Everything you need at your disposal, and you shut it off. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, notice the contrast here. We are commanded to listen carefully with precision and action and effort and chart the course of our lives to Christ. And if we don't, we drift. We aggressively pursue Christ or we passively drift away. You see the middle ground there? Christian life is like an uphill drive. Your foot's on the gas or you're rolling backwards. I think too many Christians are looking for a Christian life that's like a self-driving car. Autopilot, lane departure warnings, etc. The kind of Christian life where we can just kind of live and do our thing our way and on occasion. When we get into danger, there's a little vibration on our tushy that tells us, oh, we're too close to the lane marker. That's not the Christian life. That's death. The stakes of this journey are eternal. Your life is at stake. Don't drift away. You say, well, how do I know if I'm drifting? It's simple. Just are you pursuing Christ? If not, then you're drifting. You say, but no. Are you pursuing Christ? You say, but I grew up in, who cares? Are you pursuing Christ? You say, but I learned, I don't care. Are you pursuing Christ? Well, I used to. Now, are you pursuing Christ? In verses two to four, we see some common areas of drift, a drift into apathy, a drift into arrogance, and a drift into familiarity. First, look at verses two, at verse two and the beginning of verse three. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape 
if we neglect such a great salvation. Church family, watch out for this drift into familiarity. This, this is unbelievable. The message declared by angels, what's that? That's, all, that's the Old Testament or at least the Deuteronomic law. It proved reliable. Every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, meaning God's going to avenge his holiness and his glory. There will be judgment. How shall we escape? Escape what? God's wrath. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? The answer is we won't. The preacher says, listen, church family. I know life is hard. I remember years ago we were persecuted there in Rome and we see persecution coming. We were expelled from Rome and we feel it coming. Our family hates us because we worship a crucified Messiah. I get it. I know the pagans ridicule you because you say that Caesar isn't God. You're these fanatics that believe there's only one God. I understand, but don't let your familiarity with the gospel steal your joy in the gospel. Just because you know what God requires and you've heard it a million times, don't move on from it. Don't get away from it. Soak in it. Remember, if you transgress God, if you sin against God and have not asked for deliverance, you will not escape the judgment that is coming. The preacher says, verse two, remember the law of Moses? Remember the prophets? Remember who, those who mediated the law of Moses, the angels? They delivered to us a message that proved true. We often fail to remember that the Old Testament is reliable. Every transgression or disobedience received a just and deserved retribution or payment or punishment for sin. The preacher is going to make a logical argument. If the Old Testament was true, even though it was incomplete and God punished sin, then don't you think this new final message from Christ will also ring true? God will punish sin. Don't be so familiar with how God operates that you forget your sins have earned your death. Are you sure you're ready for that? Your transgressions will bring punishment. Or there in the verse two, just retribution. An eye for an eye. The punishment fit the crime. That was unheard of in the times of the Pentateuch. The norm was a ruthless punishment. A head for a tooth. A life for an eye. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 28. Read them sometimes. See the paradigmatic beauty of what God offers to his people, the just punishment for their crimes, the protection for the perpetrators as was necessary, the care for the innocent. But the ultimate reality was offenses against God deserve death. Every Israelite knew they couldn't live without transgressing the law. And God promised them retribution. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and the length of your days that you may dwell in the land of the Lord that he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob to give to them. What was Israel's only hope? Loving Yahweh, serving Yahweh, that he would care for them because he loved them. He promised them. But if they rejected him, what would come to them? Death, curse, punishment. The generation that failed to obey Yahweh after the exodus, what happened to them? They wandered for 40 years until they died in the wilderness. God punishes sin. The wages of sin is dirt. From the dirt you came, from dirt you'll go back to. That's the message to Adam. That's the reality for us. The Old Testament law is clear. If we argue from the lesser to the greater, if the wonderful but incomplete message by the angels to the Israelites is true, and their just retribution would come, then how much more clear should it be that when Jesus sends his final, or when God sends his final revelation in his son, Jesus, that what he says is going to be true? Verse three, what's your only hope to escape this just retribution escape? How can you get away? Well, let me tell you what's not going to get you away, drifting in a religious familiarity. 
Have you become so familiar with the great salvation that we have in Christ that you've chosen to drift away from it and just neglect it and just come to church? Verse three, notice again the we. Nobody escapes this warning. How shall we, if we neglect it, This is a burden on the preacher for us all. The preacher says, wake up, church family. We're all in danger of this reality that we just kind of, hmm, grace, grace. Escape. You will not escape on your own. You say, but I feel fine. Well, unless you're feeling fine because you're careful to hold to Christ, then you're drifting. And in your familiarity, you're drifting. And instead of falling into more grace, you'll fall into judgment. Thinking God will let me off the hook in the end is not understanding who God is in the beginning. Dear friend, you are who he is talking to now. And he says, you will not escape the punishment you deserve if you neglect the salvation that he has achieved. We are being warned. Are you listening? Be vigilant, friends. Hold fast to Christ, friends. Beware of the temptation of familiarity and escape the judgment that you've earned by the beauty of what Christ has achieved. Being here is not the same as being in Christ. Being here is not the same as focusing your life on Christ. How do you know if you're in danger of drifting away from Christ into familiarity with Christian-y things? Do you pay close attention to Christ? That's your only comfort. These warnings should scare us a touch, but don't fear the wrong thing. Instead, listen to the right thing, Jesus and his gospel, and focus just on that. In the middle of verse 3, we're warned to watch out for our drift into arrogance. Look at the middle part of verse 3. It was declared at first by the Lord. Do we come to God's word like that? Of first importance, it was declared by the Lord. I wonder, if you found out that Jesus was preaching this morning, would something have changed in your routine today? You probably would have gotten up a little early. You bald guys would have waxed your head. The rest of us would have made sure we were trimmed up, ready to go. Mint in our pocket in case we had to meet him. No. You would have been on your knees begging for mercy. Don't you think? Jesus shows up, the word of the Lord declared at first by the Lord. Can we hear the message declared by our Lord and not respond in humility and not respond, oh my God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The creator and sustainer of the world, Jesus has spoken the final revelation of God. Are you listening? Turn to Mark chapter 8, one of my least favorite gospel passages. I think this gospel presentation by our Savior would flunk most church programs today. This is how he declared the gospel. Jesus said, Mark chapter 8, verse 34 and following, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? The creator and sustainer of the world, the object of our faith, our only hope for salvation, our only hope for life, is not offering you a plan for your happiness He says, follow me. I'm what's best. Say, but I want, where does that factor in? He says, follow me. I'm what's best. But in our arrogance, we find something better. Maybe it's a theology. Maybe it's a way of life. Maybe it's a set of friends. And you find yourself in this current that's causing you to drift away and you're happy. And in your arrogance, You think Jesus wasn't exactly talking to you. When you share the throne with Jesus and you set the course for your life with Jesus, that's arrogance. That's a drift. 
When you write the gospel alongside Jesus, that's arrogance. You're drifting. Arrogance is a drift that leads to the deadly destruction that Jesus himself promised. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 7, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. Jesus says judgment is coming. Only the arrogant would say, you know, I prayed a prayer. God saved me. I can live however I want. That's not perseverance of the saints. That's not eternal security. That's the arrogance of religiously polished depravity. Judgment is coming. Are you clinging to Christ? Is the course of your life set in his direction? Or has arrogance set you adrift? Listen to what was declared at first by the Lord. I wonder, are you listening? Finally, in verse 4, Notice the drift into apathy. The preacher to the Hebrews lists three reasons we should believe the message of Christ that was declared by him. End of verse three. It's attested to us by those who heard. I can only imagine that in this congregation of Jews in Rome, there was somebody there who had maybe been at Pentecost and they'd heard the message of Peter and they'd come back and they said, guys, he came. The Messiah had come the long-awaited, much-anticipated prophet, priest, and king is here. Second, in verse four, God himself bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles. God has always used the miraculous to authenticate his new revelation. The life and ministry of Christ was no different. Everything that Jesus said, but you've heard it said, but I say to you, Jesus has a new revelation. He's the final revelation for his people. You know it was authenticated by God. Jesus left a trail of miracles that nobody could deny saying that has to be the Christ. This new and living way, the preacher calls it in chapter 10. Jesus couldn't work miracles. Jesus couldn't preach a new gospel. Only apathy rejects the miracles of Christ. Third, the end of the verse four, the Holy Spirit distributed gifts to Christ's body according to his will. Have you seen what God has done for some of the people here? How he's changed some of your lives? Maybe you know some of your shepherds and you realize their past ain't what they are now. They've been changed by God. Maybe you know some of the choicest servants in this church used to be the most selfish people you could ever meet. Who does that? Only the Spirit. Can you be so apathetic to the verified truth of God that you drift into eternal destruction? The short answer is yes. Yes, you can. The real question is, are you? Are you drifting towards destruction or are you clinging to Christ? Are you drifting towards destruction or are you charting your course for the beauty of who Christ is? Definitionally, when we consider that we drifted, we moved away. Jesus didn't move away from us. Jesus is high and lifted up. He is sitting at the right hand of his Father on his throne on high He's not moving. He's not going anywhere. We're the ones who've drifted away from him. C.S. Lewis sagely remarked in his book, Mere Christianity, talking about people who walk away from the faith. He says, as a matter of fact, if you examined 100 people who had lost their faith in Christianity, I wonder how many of them would turn out to have been reasoned out of it by an honest argument. Do not most people simply drift away? That's what I've seen. It's pretty rare that people have a reason other than years of feeling a certain way compounded by apathy, arrogance, and familiarity, and then all of a sudden they say Christianity is not true. So why do we drift? Well, I'm going to get to seven currents of drift that might serve to warn you. They all kind of cause us to drift. We often don't know it. We often feel it. But we often don't feel it enough to change it. It's just kind of there and we're comfortable with it. So we drift and then we drift some more and then we drift a little bit more and then we look up and Jesus is gone. Friend, anything that isn't causing you to hold fast to Christ is making you drift. Quit viewing your life like a playground. It's a battleground. Satan is seeking people to devour. First Peter chapter five, verse eight, he's roaming the earth like a roaring lion. He's coming for your soul. Are you pursuing Christ and the safety that he affords? Or are you 
drifting? Are you listening to Christ? Or are you drifting? As I list some of these currents, if you identify with these currents as causing you to drift, don't think you're not saved. Think you need to be more strategic and passionate and careful in your pursuit of Christ. Unless perhaps you know that you're not saved. Then don't worry about the drift. Worry about your soul. Worry about the fact that you cannot escape what is coming for you. Because God has offered to you life. He's given to you his son. He said, here, here's all you need. I put him in front of you. He has you here today. Turn to him and be saved. Ask someone. Ask the person you came with. Ask a stranger. Get help to know Christ. First thing that causes us to drift is busyness. You're too busy. You're on the phone too much. You're at a ball game all the time. You're serving your kids or you're on permanent vacation. Friend, too busy is not an acceptable excuse to put off worship of Christ. Focus on Christ. Say, but my job is, who picked that job? You did. Get a different one. He's worth more than whatever keeps you busy. Second, we're just lazy. The Lord of glory died in our place. And if we don't think that we should have to work to worship him, we don't value him as he deserves. We have a puny view of him and a high view of our soul. He is worthy of your effort. Laziness will set you adrift and Christ will shrink until one day he is gone. Third, family. Family over everything, even Jesus. Say, I thought this church was big on family. We are, but we're bigger on Jesus. He's always better. Even than your cute little kids, Jesus is better. And this isn't just for the helicopter parents or the homeschool moms or the dads who make their kids play sports so they can relive their glory days of JV. (laughs) All of us need more Christ than ever anything else. And if things are in between you and Christ, get them out of the way. Put them in their proper place. You may need to say no to your family and yes to Christ. You can do that and benefit your family. Fourth, happy. Well, surely Jesus loves me enough to give me my version of happiness but I don't have it, so he must want me to go get it. The health, wealth, and prosperity gospel has snuck into what Jesus says and overridden what he has claimed. He says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And we say, every day is a Friday. I deserve a Cadillac. If wealth and pleasure are your main pursuit, Jesus is not. He will not let you pursue both him and junk. Get it straight. If all you're after is happiness, you're not after Christ. Fifth, celebrity. Maybe popularity. Shouldn't everybody like you and be your friend if you're pursuing Jesus and be impressed with you? Friend, if you're worried about the opinions of others, you're drifting towards them and not charting your course towards Christ. Sixth, easy It's a little bit different than lazy. This is for the person who assumes Jesus meant to give them the easy life. But their life is hard and they get bitter at Christ because it's difficult to worship him. Don't be bitter, friend. Embrace the struggle of this life. This life is an exile. Why? So we set our hopes on heaven and we long for that day, which isn't right now, but maybe later today, where we go to him in glory. Set your hope on heaven and not earth. The cross before the crown. Don't get it backwards. Seventh, religion Many people love church activity, but don't really love Jesus. They find here good friends, nice people, stuff to occupy their time. There's many more currents, but these should get you thinking. Maybe you wonder what will happen to me if I don't fight these currents. You say, I kind of feel fine. I can take pauses and breaks from pursuing Christ. I pursued Christ really hard when I first got saved. 
and now we have a few kids, you know, and we want the best for them, and we want them to play team ball, and we'll get plugged in when the kids aren't as busy or when homeschooling is easier. We'll get plugged in then, or maybe once my career is established, we'll really get plugged in, and then your kids are gone, and then work once more of you, and then you start to travel, and then you buy a timeshare, and then church is really good when family comes together, but when family comes together, it's hard to get to church on time, so we'll just live stream. But then it gets harder to live stream because we can't get it on the big screen. So we just watch it on the computer and then it's only me and then I want to be with my family. And so we'll worry about that later. Then one day you wake up and you find that you don't really care all that much that you're pretty disconnected from Christ and his people. Well, that's evidence to the rest of us that you never really did care. And you'll say Christianity isn't real. And we'll say you were never saved. And then you'll say, we're a cult. And we'll say, our hearts are broken for you. And you will die in your sins because you refuse the grace of God through the purifying prophet, priest, and king, Jesus. And the scary thing is that some of you here now listening to this warning, but are you listening? Are you listening to Christ? We must pay closer attention, much closer attention to what we've heard about Christ, lest we drift away from Christ. You don't have to be Miss Cleo with a crystal ball to chart the course of people's lives. Just read your Bible and check their schedule. Read your Bible, watch how they spin. Read your Bible and notice who their friends are. What do you find? You find who or what they are paying closest attention to. But who cares about other people? We're here to talk about you. Let me ask you, who or what do you pay closest attention to? If it isn't Jesus and his word and his gospel and those who push you to him, then one day we may say you never knew him. And again, the sad part, some of you are close. You're drifting, but you can still see Jesus. You're kind of close to Jesus, but you're drifting and you haven't gone far. And instead of being pleased by the short distance away from Jesus that you are, you should be terrified by the fact that you're drifting and not running to him, not charting the course of your life directly at Jesus. You should draw near to Christ, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. You should hold fast to Christ, chapter 10, verse 23. You should set your anchor in the hope that is Christ Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. And the beautiful thing about our anchor being in Christ is it doesn't go down to the seabed to drag and get caught on some rocks. It goes up to the heavenly places to be rooted in the beauty of who our Savior is. So are you paying all attention and tracking your life towards Christ? Or have you fallen to the currents of drift? If you have, which ones? What's causing you to drift away? Which things are pulling you away from Christ? Men, do you know you're especially important because your drift causes your family to drift? You're the leader or should be. If you're not pursuing Christ, then here's what you should expect of your family, to not pursue Christ. If you're not pursuing Christ, then when your kids grow up, you should expect them to exit You should expect your wife to not want to follow you. Why? You're not following Christ. But brother, sister, are you willing to pursue Christ over all the things that pull you away from Christ? I can't answer that question for you. I don't need to. You need to answer that question before your Savior. You know what pulls you from him. Get rid of it. Here's my suggestion that I'll steal from Jesus, whatever it is, Matthew chapter 5, verse 30. Cut it off, gouge it out, get rid of it, throw it into the fire, and save your soul. Don't allow the mediocrity of American so called Christianity to lure you into drifting away from Christ on the channels of eternal destruction. See, but there's a slow drift. Oh, friend, there is no drift that is okay. I don't want to do your funeral hoping you are a believer. Chase Christ. Chart the course of your life directly at him. You should long to know Christ more so you can feel the assurance that he provides. 
That's the beauty of these warning passages. If we follow their instruction, we don't have to fear. The fear comes when we try to hold both. I'm going to live my life how I want it, and I want Jesus to save me. Jesus said, what? Pick up your cross. Deny yourself and follow me. Friend, are you listening If you heed the warning, your faith is encouraged. If you disregard the warning, your soul is in peril. We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard about Christ, lest we drift away from him. Let me pray. Father, help us this morning to feel the truth of God saturating our hearts that we would see both the fear in this warning and the comfort that comes, the assurance that comes as we heed it. Help our Savior to be more valuable than anything else, more clear in our life than any other affection. Give us a direction that's just him. Help us to shed the junk that so often takes our energy, talents, passion. Help us to pour our lives out for him. In his glory we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.